Okay. <clears throat> the following interview was conducted with Sonia Margarine for the uh, former mayor of West Lafayette, Indiana from 1980 to 2004 for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, September 29, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome and good afternoon. Thank you. Sonia. Let's start off, tell us a little bit while you were born and your parents and siblings in early years. Yeah. Well, I was, for a politician, I was born in Washington, D.C., which <laughs> gave me a, a leg up. Uh, but my father worked for the government and went to law school in Washington. And so then I lived there till I was 16, and we moved back to Iowa, where my uh, father uh, practiced law, and I went to high school in Iowa. Okay. Tell us a little about where did you go to grade school in the district? Yeah, or in the district. Yeah, in the district, I went to grade school, and then we lived in Maryland in Montgomery County, and. Uh, went to uh, Silver Spring, Tacoma Park, Bethesda. Sure, okay. So, uh, tell us a little, then in, in high school in Iowa, tell us a little about any of the organizations or what high school yeah. was like out there. Well, uh, it's, it's a little it bit was of a change a, though, huh? Yeah, it was quite a change. In fact, uh, I, I cried all the way out to Iowa thinking <laughs> this was the end of my life, but uh, I enjoyed it very much. Uh, I had lots of uh, cousins and relatives there. and. Grinnell uh, College is in Grinnell, Iowa. It's a town of about 7,000. So uh, it was a, a college town and had all the advantages sure. of a college town. And uh, uh, so I was active in high school in the, uh, I was on Some the- Some student clubs. And yeah, the student, uh, I was uh, president of the student body in my junior year and president of, or uh, uh, editor of the yearbook and uh, a lot of other athletic organizations. What was the size of the high school? Was it a large one? Oh, no, small? no. It was, I think there was 120 in our graduating class, so it was not a large high school. You got to know everybody. Yes, right. That's nice. <laughs> okay, then, uh, then what came next? Well, then right. I went to St. Olaf College How'd in you to Northfield, Minnesota. Select well, that? well uh, it was a Norwegian Lutheran college, and uh, my uh, grandfather, grandparents came from Norway, so we had a strong family tradition of relation of relating to Norway. And uh, my uh, parents were interested in my going to a, a Lutheran college, and uh, that seemed like the farthest one away. <laughs> so that's where I decided can't to get go. home on weekends. Yeah. <laughs> but it was a very good choice uh, because uh, Saint Olaf has a very strong science department and. Uh, I was uh, I majored in biology and then uh, had to take so many uh, chemistry and physics courses that I did a double major in biology and chemistry. Good. And uh, plus, it was a liberal arts college, sure. and I was very interested in history and political science and. <laughs> Great many other things. Anyone from else from your high school that went there, or you were the only one? No, I okay. was the only one. That, okay. uh, Do you have any went. brothers or sisters? Yes, no, I okay. have a younger sister. Okay. Uh, she's eight years younger than I am, uh, Karen, and uh, she went to St. Olaf also. Okay. Well, that worked uh, out nicely. So then. that worked yeah. out well, fine. Then, um, what was your what happened after you graduated from high school? What came next? Uh, graduate from college, or, or college, yeah, yeah, college, yeah. yeah. Right. Well, um, I, that was uh, 1952, and uh, so I started looking around for jobs. I had thought at one time that I might be interested in medical technology or research in biology, but that was all going to require some more training or, or a master's degree. And uh, I was offered a job at uh, Ames Lab at Iowa State University. Um, Ames Lab was kind of the last uh, part of the Manhattan Project, uh, which had to do with the, with the making of the atomic bomb. And uh, so this was a, a, a highly secret lab, uh, and everybody knew it was there, of course, but uh, we had to have Q clearance and uh, uh, worked uh, with uh, under security. And um, my job was I worked in the uh, uh, control lab uh, to analyze thorium and uranium and rare earth specimens and uh, to uh, to sample all the products that were going into the making of thorium. They they made thorium, which was one of the metals in the bomb. Sure. So it was a very interesting. Super job. job. It was an interesting job. Lots of interesting people and. Uh, 
my husband was a, a graduate student, uh, and his major professor was in charge of the control lab when there was about 15 or 20 of us in the control lab. And then he had 15 or 20 graduate students who were doing research and assisting. And so uh, that's how we, we met over a Bunsen burner, <laughs> literally. That's pretty good. Yeah. If what's in pharmacy is the mortar and pestle, right? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> oh. Well, then, when then what came? What was your career well? Path then you came to uh, he was uh, finishing up his his degree and uh, his Did you get major. Married out there? Uh, uh, yes. Then okay. we were we were married in 1953. And uh, his major professor was offered a position at Purdue, and uh, he decided he wanted to stay where he was, but he suggested that he had this bright young graduate student that would be just perfect for it. But uh, Dale hadn't finished his degree yet. <laughs> so we uh, picked up and came out to Purdue, and uh, he spent his first year here finishing up his PhD and, uh, and then getting acquainted. Uh, and was, West Lafayette. Did you, would you drive to from there? Yes. What was your impression? No, you'd never been here before. No, no, I hadn't been here before. But Had Dale it's, been? it's much like Iowa, sure. so it wasn't all that different. Had Dale come before for an interview? Yes. He, oh. Well, no, he didn't even come for an interview. Those were the the days where <laughs> they didn't uh, have a formal kind of. A process. We have an opening faculty. in your Yeah, that's right. We need somebody right away. Right. And of course, this you know, there's still a large number of veterans coming back, and they were in desperate need of a faculty. So, sure. um, so we kind of came. <laughs> where did Where did you uh, reside? Where did you live? When well, you we lived down on Wood Street, on the corner of Wood and Grant, where the uh, graduate house is now. And uh, we lived in an old house. Uh, we lived upstairs, and another faculty family lived downstairs. Uh, and in fact, that was characteristic of those times. This, this would have been 53, 54. And we lived in that house until 1960. And uh, most of the faculty lived in converted houses south of State Street. Because there were a lot more houses than there are today. Yeah, right there. there were. And uh, by the way, people lived in the village over some of the businesses. And um, I mean, things were so bad there for a while that people were sleeping in their cars. I mean, it was really a, tight. It was very tight. And a lot of. Uh, Families then, you know, took in sure. uh, students to uh, live. Was the varsity apartment, was that built at that time? Was yeah. that here? Okay. Varsity apartments was there. And the village was truly a village then. Uh, there was a, 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 a women's clothing store and a men's clothing store. And Follett's was kind of a, almost a department store. They had a variety of things. There was a the Wiggly Piggly Piggly Wiggly grocery store. I've heard that mention. I've heard that name mentioned. <laughs> yeah, and uh, and a, and a, a butcher shop, and they delivered groceries for you, and uh, you could just charge them, and then they would deliver. Right. Was the book was the bookstore where it is now? Yeah, oh, Follett's was, was. Yeah, Follett's was there. Okay. University Bookstore was where it is now. Okay. University Bookstore was across the street now, where. Um, um, uh, Craner is. Oh, okay, okay. And um, that was that was on the on the corner there, and uh, so but the village looked pretty much the same. Vons was there, and there was a a big uh, hardware store, Dillon's, uh, wow. which was uh, had everything that you could possibly want. That hardware want. stores used to have. Yeah, hardware yeah. and everything. You know, Halloween costumes and. <laughs> Everything. So the village was truly a and w and it was within walking distance. That's great. Yes, yes. So we walked to campus. I w worked in the and then I got a job. I was going to ask you what you did. Yeah, I worked in the chemistry department. Okay. Uh, I worked in the micro analytical lab, so I I worked there for about well five years. Okay. Would that have been in what's known as Weatherall today? Uh, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Okay. It was in the in Weatherall. Okay. And um, uh, Professor Yao, uh, Cheng Sing Yao, was uh, uh, was my uh, boss, and uh, so we were, we were good friends then for many many years. Sure. that's nice. Yeah. Well, let's see now. Then uh, shall we move a little bit to the university and the mayor? 
Okay. So, how did you? Can well, there was there was a little period in between. Okay. All right. Our ahead. first child was born in 1959, and uh, so we we lived, as I say, down uh -huh. on, on State Street, and uh, then we bought a, a, a house. Well, we built a house. Uh, where we live presently, which is on Seminole Drive, just off of Indian Trail. Right. And so we moved, and then we had a second son. So when we moved into that house, we had uh, 1960, and we had one baby who was two or three months old, and then a one and a half year old. And uh, then I stayed home for 20 years, and uh, um, raised the children. Yeah, and raised the what children. What was the area? Was it very built up, Sony, at that time? It was just building up. Okay. That was just, that was Wabash Shores, uh, as right. it's uh, now known, right. uh, developed by the Lux. Uh, but there, that was just being developed. So there were, uh, that Highway 52 was just a two-lane road. Right. And uh, the high school was kind of the, the end, uh, the end of, uh, where the growth was uh, sure. just beyond that. Right. Of course, Hills was, and Dales. Uh, Hills and Dales was built. Was that yeah, built Hills and Dales was built in the 30s. Okay. And so Hills and Dales, and then it went up to uh, probably Lindbergh. Okay. Uh, okay. And then Wabash Shores is north of that between right. uh, Lindbergh and uh, 52. Yeah. Very good. So that, that all developed during that sure. period. And Smitty's, of course, was there, too. And Smitty's was there. And Burtsfield School uh, was, was established uh, in 1958, I believe, or 59. So it was immediately filled with children. Sure. And uh, they had large classes. And <laughs> uh, all, of our, all three of our children then went all the way through Burtsfield. Yeah. That was and a great location then for you. Yeah, then. yeah, it was nice. Yeah, it was. Then what came? Then what, what came next? Up well, I became active in the League of Women Voters. Uh, my mother had been uh, active in the League, and she she was a, a pretty active volunteer when we lived in Iowa. She was president of the hospital auxiliary and very active in the church. And uh, the League of Women Voters was one of her sure. pet projects. So I got involved in the league, uh, and it was uh, you, you, you know, the meetings were in the evening or in the afternoon. You could bring your children, and uh, I met lots of wonderful people who are still my good friends. Uh, and um, so many of the women who are in office or who have been office in uh, elective office all came out of the League of Women Voters. It's uh, both Republicans and Democrats. Was the League, did that, would it, would that include Lafayette and West Lafayette? Well, that's or? interesting. At that time, they were separate. There was the West Lafayette League and the Lafayette League. Okay. Uh, and then um, as I became more active and got on the board, uh, I became uh, the president in 19... I think it was in the 62 or 63. And we uh, came together then and became the Greater Lafayette League. Right. And I was always very proud of that fact that we... Uh, <laughs> that sounds reasonable because yeah. both of them would be small and, and you can do a lot with a larger group and That's working right. together. And I think the philosophy of the League has guided me through the years and that is it's a based a grassroots organization that the, uh, pr the um, ideas and the uh, programs come from the membership and uh, the, they come to consensus on what the stand is. The League takes positions on issues but never on candidates or on political parties. So it's, it's partisan on issues and nonpartisan on uh, political parties. Uh, and uh, so the, that, that philosophy, I think, has been an important one that's guided me, that you need to study the issue, get your uh, group to come together on consensus, and then take action. Right, exactly. And uh, so um, I, I really enjoyed that. Um, but then I, I was active in school organizations. Uh, With the children and things. Yes, yeah. all, yeah. And right. I, 
Uh, we just uh, went, when we were in Oregon, we went to the, our youngest grandson, or next to the youngest, uh, was just starting uh, kindergarten, and they were asking the parents, uh, to, you know, to participate, and I can remember what a thrill that was the first time that I became a room mother. <laughs> but we those, never forget, do no, we? <laughs> but those were important years, sure. and, uh, and then I was active in, in the church. I belonged to uh, our Savior Lutheran Church right off campus, and sure. so I was active in a lot of uh, church religious organizations also. But um, the um, um, league, I think, was what certainly got me started. And as uh, being in the league, I went to a lot of meetings and uh, sat and watched uh, government perform or not perform, as the case may be. And I guess about that time I thought, you know, I think maybe I could do just as good a job as some of those people sitting up there. So I began to be interested in uh, right. maybe getting involved in politics at a little deeper level. So I, um, I became a precinct committeeman, uh, which again is kind of the grassroots approach. Uh, the you get to know people too. Yeah, right. And uh, there's a lot of door-to-door, uh, uh, -door, one -on one-on-one, but then also then putting it all together into a, an action plan. Um, is the part that's always, uh, I think, the important part of, right. of uh, politics is that it leads to, to a goal of action. Right. So um, I got very involved then in, in party politics. Okay. And then the next step was you decided to run? Huh? Yes. Right. Uh, in, um, 19, and then, well, the, the very famous uh, election of 1968, if you uh, if you remember that, that election, that was uh, mm -hmm. Gene McCarthy and Bobby Kennedy and Governor Brannigan, who was a stand-in for President Johnson. And that was, uh, a, that was the primary in Indiana, and it was a very bitterly fought primary. And uh, lots of national figures, Walter Cronkite and Paul Newman came to town and all the candidates. Uh, and for the first time, Purdue really hosted a uh, political discussion. Um, the music hall, 5,000 people showed up for Gene McCarthy and a week later, 5,000 showed up for Bobby Kennedy. Uh, and uh, Teddy Kennedy came, John Kennedy came. So it, that was prior to that. So uh, I think it really, you know, began, people began to be more politically conscious of, of being uh, active in their political party and that they could make a difference. Um, so that kind of spurred me on to, <laughs> inspired me, I guess. And then you took, you decided to run. Yes, right. and okay. so in 1971, I decided that I would run for the city council. And uh, I always say that it's, it's very good to uh, be humbled <laughs> early in your career <laughs> because you don't ever forget that. And I lost. <laughs> but uh, it's but, a learning. That was a learning experience, and um, I, uh, I I think it's important uh, to to go through that and to know what it's like and to. Uh, uh, to get some experience. Um, and along the way, I met uh, a lot of people that uh, became my, my friends and supporters and right. who are still my friends. Um, Peter Core. Yeah, and um, I, I think that's one of the things that I uh, have enjoyed about politics is that I've gotten to meet a whole variety of people, people that I wouldn't have known otherwise, um, students and faculty, but union members, people from Lafayette, uh, farmers, across, wide a cross whole cross-section cross of people who care about their government and want to be participants. Right. And I, I value that experience right. and I've learned a great deal from, from all of those groups of people and individuals that I've interacted with. Um, one of my uh, early friends and supporters was Stan Jones, who some of you may remember was a student body president right. of Purdue at the time, and uh, was uh, at that time, I think, um, 
although Purdue was described as a uh, bastion of campus rest, <laughs> uh, there was some unrest and there were, you know, there was a, a sit-in at uh, the Union and, and um, uh, kind of riot in the streets of State Street. So there, there was quite a bit of agitation. Some people refer to that in my interviews as the unrest. The unrest, yeah. I think Newswick, <laughs> we that quoted us that. That's where it came from. Came from. <laughs> that it was a bed of unrest. They didn't cite the source. <laughs> <laughs> but that still people sure. got involved. And, uh, and Stan's uh, offered to help me uh, in that campaign. and. Uh, uh, even though I, I lost, <laughs> sure. uh, I did appreciate his, his help, and he was a great political organizer. He really I nice learned, person. learned a great deal right. from Sam, and as you know, he ended up as uh, chairman of the uh, higher education and is now in Washington working for the Department of, of the Gates Foundation in education. So okay. he has continued that role. But in 1972, he said, well, I think I'd like to run for the state legislature and why don't you be my campaign manager? So I don't know whether it was quite the blind leading the blind, inexperience leading inexperience. Or learning from each other. Yeah, yes. So we learned a great deal, but Stan lost. <laughs> uh, but he was... Uh, uh, but he was very active. The thing that was, uh, again, hard to remember is he conducted that whole campaign barefooted. <laughs> so that was the style then. Everybody went barefooted and <laughs> it was uh, casual uh, and uh, they marched on the, the uh, state house to try to keep tuition down and I thought it was interesting the contrast to the last increase in tuition and there was hardly a ripple. and. But at that time, it was, it was a little, uh, different time, a so. little <laughs> more active. Yeah. But then in 74, um, Stan ran for office and was successful. He was in the Senate, right? St uh, State Senate? No, he was in the House. He was in the House. He was in the House then for 16 years. Right. But he continued to be, uh, I, I, he wasn't my campaign manager, but very active in but all the campaign. Uh, that I ran, and uh, Marguerite Trackman, whose husband Lee Trackman has been an active faculty member for years, was my campaign manager uh, for six terms and Stan's campaign manager for six terms. So um, that's that's, very nice. she's got quite a <laughs> good, experience, good but... experience, and we both uh, are very grateful to her for sure. her help. But I think that's the kind of thing that's interesting about politics is that you uh, uh, get to know people that you wouldn't have known otherwise who work very hard for you and you've never known them before and then maybe your best friend doesn't participate at all because that's just not their thing. They right. just don't care to do that. So uh, it, it's kind of interesting that uh, it the appeals. differences in the people that uh, and where they come and what they're what they're willing to to give for that thing. Yeah, that's and right. In different, they give it in different different at uh, different levels. That's right. Yeah. And uh, I certainly would never blame anybody that because yeah. they didn't do this or that. But it's just interesting how many people have come along and said. I like what you're saying, I'd like to help you, and then really work very hard on your behalf. And, right. and I said that the... the uh, you, you get value to, that. Yeah. And you people, you get to know people at their best and their worst, right. Right. and they also see you at your worst and your best. <laughs> so uh, it... Uh, it's uh, a big sharing, and, and, you, and you learn each day, and you look back on it, and you still learn from it. Yeah, yes, you do. Even the times when you felt the lowest, <laughs> you take something away from that's that, right. and should. I mean, that's, that's, right. that's exactly. part of life, is, yeah. is to gain something from, from that experience. And a lot of people don't take advantage of gaining like something, and they should. Yeah. It's an individual kind of thing. That's yeah. right. Well, good. Now, can you so tell then, us? Some, yeah, oh, then, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, then uh, 1976, um, I decided, well, that I would run again. Now, my two children, uh, my oldest two, the uh, oldest one graduated from high school in 1976, and the younger one graduated in 77. So that seemed like a, a pretty good time to do it. They were sure. 
well launched and then, then by then we had another son who was in eighth grade and um, so I thought that that would be a good time could to work do it. it in, yeah. yeah. And uh, so I ran for the city council then and I was successful so I, I was launched I guess you would say. I was finally successful. <laughs> I'm on my way. Right? Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Although at the time I certainly wasn't looking much beyond that. Right. I was just trying to one win a day. Right? Yeah, that's right. Trying to keep everything together, and then I guess I began to think uh, if I'm going to be involved in politics and government, whether I run for office or whether I'm a volunteer or whether I uh, um, maybe end up. Uh, teaching or doing something else, I need an advanced degree. My, as I said, my degrees were in chemistry and biology. So I decided to go, Purdue was starting a um, public policy program. And, um, and uh, I thought that sounded just exactly what I wanted to do. So I enrolled in that program. And uh, so I worked on my master's then from 76 to 79. And um, that was, again, a great experience. Uh, it was uh, brand, you know, computer. We, we had little, we were doing the early days of computers when you had little boxes full of cards. And if you tripped and dropped them, you know, your, <laughs> your semester's work was done. <laughs> I, I heard about those cards. <laughs> <laughs> and then I learned to, uh, you know, be like a student, go over to the math building and sit on the floor at one o'clock in the mm. morning waiting to get on the computer. With my cards. <laughs> yeah, with my cards. Right. But uh, I learned a great deal, obviously. And, it was an appropriate uh, time in your life to do that kind of thing. Yeah, it was. it was. Just it worked was, out nicely with what you'd been doing yeah, up till then. It point. was, and it was kind of a step forward. And uh, um, I, I took uh, several courses in public policy and then quite a few courses in civil engineering, which at the time I didn't think about it, but that proved to be very valuable. A transportation course and one in systems analysis, uh, and then the, the computer statistics course and uh, economics. And, a nice, uh, nice balance. So I was able to put together a program that I thought would be useful for me. and. Um, Actually, I finally got my the things began to change a little bit because the the person who started the program left, and uh, so I actually got my degree in political science then. Okay. But it was the same program, sure. and they continued for a few more years. And uh, but I got my degree in 1979 in May, and uh, was elected mayor then in the fall of 1979. Very nice. So that was uh, a new era, a new step. <laughs> but that was uh, a very difficult time, as you can imagine, trying to go to school, keep up with children and family. And at the same time, my husband was head of the chemistry department. And uh, so uh, it was, I look back on it, I don't know how we did it, except we I was it. quite a bit younger then. <laughs> <laughs> we could do it. Yeah. We can do it. <laughs> right. Oh. But uh, it was it, w it was very good, and I was uh, I, the person I ran against was uh, Katie Hunter, who was a council member uh, with me, and so for the first time, two women ran for um, for the mayor mayor, mayor. <laughs> and we said the you know the those who were against women in office had no place to go; <laughs> they, they didn't have any choice. But it was a very, um, I think, a, a good campaign, and um, and I was fortunate enough to win, so I was I was obviously thrilled. Um, That's right. And uh, then I I, I Took always office. remember thinking, <laughs> uh, I don't know whether you remember the Robert Redford movie, The Candidate. And uh, you know he's he's this sort of unknown person, and they they push him into the presidency. And at the end of the film, he's sitting in his his seat, and he looks at the camera, and he said, "What do we do now?" <laughs> and I must admit, I had a little bit of that. That's okay. That's that part feeling. of that's part of the process. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I'm here. <laughs> yeah, but it is rather awe-inspiring, and. Um, 
to all of a sudden, the day you walk into office, you've got to make a hundred decisions about things you know very little about. I, I had uh, you know, been active when I was on the council, and uh, I tried to, you know, understand as well as I could what was going on in government. And uh, Mayor Dean Hart, who was the mayor at that time, okay. I asked him if I could sit in on council meetings. He was a Republican, but he was willing to let me do that. And um, so I had a little experience, but it's nothing like when you're sitting there and you've got to make the decision. And uh, so... The buck stops here, yeah, right? <laughs> that's right. So it, uh, it, it is, uh, uh, at first, uh, oh. certainly... <laughs> Um, and but you grow with it. You yeah, know. you do. And I had some very good people uh, to help me. Which you've nurtured over the years. Yes. And we had a, a we had a, Demo there was a, a majority of Democrats who were elected with me, so that helped a little sure. bit. It was four to three, and then one of the Democrats left and went, took another job. So it reverted back to the Republican four to three. But uh, but that was not uh, a huge uh, right. thing to overcome because they were people I, I knew somewhat. Right. But I think the key is having good people uh, who you can depend on and whose judgment you trust. I mean, obviously, I'm not a civil engineer. I learned a great deal about it, but you've got to have an engineer who, when he says, this is the way it's got to be, here's how you have to run the wastewater treatment plan, here's the rules. Uh, this is an expert to, that you can depend upon and really knows what he yeah. or she is talking about. And I think the mistake sometimes that uh, mayors or people moving into new jobs think they have to decide everything and that they've got to uh, micromanage everything. And, um, you know, eventually you do have to know a great deal more, but at first you really need to depend on other people. And you uh, learn from them too. And oh, the others. absolutely. And that's part of it. That's what yeah. education is all about. And you, they bring something to the table that, that can assist and, and you value that. Yeah. Right. You know. And I had a, a very good city attorney, Bob Bauman, who mm -hmm. had been, actually he was Stan's <laughs> uh, friend and then he kind of came in to help me. And uh, he is a very, very smart guy. And uh, uh, my father was a, um, an attorney. And um, so he was, of course, very interested. They came, my mother and father came for the inauguration. And obviously, they were very proud of their daughter. And, and so my father said, well, first thing you got to do is get the code, the Indiana code. And I said, well, why do I need that? I mean, I'm not judge and they said, but you need that. And I didn't realize at the time, but <laughs> I soon realized you've got to know state law as well as uh, your local ordinances. In fact, state law and federal law are probably a lot more important <laughs> than, than ordinances because you can always change the ordinances, but you can't, you just have to obey the state and federal That's law. Over, that overrides it. And that, I think, is the hardest thing because you can make some very serious errors just not knowing. Uh, that there's another law that uh, supersedes yeah, it. Yeah, that supersedes it. So sure. uh, having an attorney and, uh, and also there was a, there's a lot of smart people in West Lafayette who are a lot of people in civil engineering and, and biology and, and uh, all of the environmental issues that certainly will tell me, <laughs> would tell me and were quite vocal about uh, right. telling me if I w was wrong or <laughs> needed some the, more the information. The good part, the good ahead, and yeah. the overall uh, results which might occur. Yeah, right. and so th that's very important, to be sure. open to information. And then the real challenge is how do you sort out the information and decide which is more important, and then how do you apply that then to the actions that have to be taken. And uh, that's part of that experience thing, and uh, it always reminds me of a joke that I used to tell about the guy that worked for a company and made this terrible mistake and caused $10 million loss to his company, and so the boss calls him in and he said, well, 
Uh, I suppose you want to fire me, and he said, "No, I just invested ten million dollars in your education. You got to stay now." <laughs> so, <laughs> good line. <Yeah. laughs> so I think that that was important. But the uh, the issues at that time were were really uh, starting in the '60s. Of course, there had been the movement of students into the into the. Uh, uh, housing surrounding campus, and that set up a real conflict with with the neighborhoods around campus. Who, well, they got lots of students next door, and they stayed up late partying, and they had children to put to bed, and sure. trash left in the neighborhood. So there was it was a very difficult time because we had no way at that time of handling that. It was it was a brand new change. Uh, and also, Purdue had changed their attitude, uh, well, it was nationwide, and no longer, if there was a problem off campus, could you call up the dean of students and he would call people in and say, stop doing that, or they'd call their parents. Uh, uh, in loco parentis, it was gone, <laughs> was gone by then. So once students were off campus, it was the responsibility of the city. And uh, so that was a very difficult time. We managed to get a code enforcement program. And uh, it was a big struggle, And uh, but I'm proud to say that's still the program we're using, and that was done in about 81, 82. Mm -hmm. So it's proved that it was, it's been was modified, but uh, basically the code enforcement yeah. program is. Was it during that time they started the building of the apartments too? Yes, okay. yes. Because and before that, there, when I've been here a long time, as you know, there weren't a lot of, of apartments. Uh, and students, yeah. of course, lived on campus, but yeah. there wasn't as many yeah. as there are now. Yeah, and then students just started moving off campus right. in droves. Right. And uh, so it, it changed the nature of neighborhoods. The whole landscape yeah. there. And, uh, and then there was, uh, as I say, the, the conflicts became really quite good. Difficult. We uh, also instituted a noise ordinance, which again is still in effect and it's worked. And the uh, purpose of the noise ordinance was if it's too noisy that it offends you, then it's too noisy. And uh, we went through a big process. Well, you've got to, you know, have certain decibel limits and all that, and found out that that was very difficult to do. We had a class at Purdue who <laughs> worked on that. So, um, but we were able then to kind of put the, the lid on the excessive noise uh, late at night and after 12. And uh, that, that gradually has made a difference. And also the change in attitude of students and the in Purdue has changed right. over yeah. that period of time. But those, those were very difficult yeah. times. Uh, the uh, your partnership with PRF, particularly that uh, the development with the park, yeah. Purdue Research Park, you had a liaison with them. You want to comment on that? Yes, yeah. that has been a, a long, as you know. Sure. Uh, PRF really developed all of the land north of the bypass, all of uh, Barbary U Heights University U Park. That's right. Yeah, because that was those were all Purdue farms. That's right. So they actually developed Barbary Heights and then sold it to various uh, builders and university farms. Then they sold off that sure. and the developers did it themselves. And the very beginnings of the research parks then started uh, when Henschel, who many people remember, was the uh, uh, head of PRF. Mm -hmm. And um, it moved very slowly at first and um, there were some serious problems with drainage and zoning and um, I think some of the kind of the early problems were that Purdue felt, the, the, at least some of the people in the administration, that they knew best how to do things and that they really didn't need to be subject to local uh, controls <laughs> and uh, that that began to to cause some problems, I think. Well, not I think, I know. Yeah. Um, but the, then that, that whole land began to develop and it was certainly in our, both of our best interests sure. that West Lafayette would grow because uh, the university was just growing at a huge rate and there, were not, there was not enough housing by a long shot. Right. Um, and that's why people started moving out. They started building apartments 
And then the issue came of tearing down older houses and putting apartments in place. And uh, so there were a lot of conflicts. Uh, would, I would imagine. Yeah. Right. And uh, then at what point do you sort of say, well, that's the way things are going. We'll just have to give in. And how much do you insist on maintaining standards that maybe are not still quite appropriate? So at some point, I think we sort of made the decision that south of State Street was going to be a student area. And uh, we, would, we had to insist on uh, safe conditions. And that was one of the things we found, that they were just and running for office and knocking on doors and crawling up ladders into apartments that went on the top of a roof. Uh, we realized that there had to be something done about it code enforcement. And so we institute a lot of things like um, uh, smoke detectors and firewalls and new construction. So there were a lot of things that were done uh, at that time. And you put in the railings on a lot of those too. Yeah. There were, didn't many of, even if there was a, a walk down at the end, you put a small railing there. Yeah. And they, did, they didn't, I mean, in a home where it had apartments in there, you know. Yeah. So, but each one of those little steps were always a right. struggle because <laughs> then developers didn't want to pay for them and then they would tell the students that they would cause their, their uh, rent to go up. And <laughs> so we're always trying to balance these uh, uh, contending. <laughs> little, little factions in there. Yeah, right. that's right. Yeah. Of course, then Discovery Park came along too. Yes, yeah. well, of course, that was just a huge it's, jump forward. and. Oh, yeah. uh, uh, that, Great facility. That, that just, just has made an enormous difference. And uh, the research park was, as I say, very slow to get started, right. but it wasn't quite time yet. I mean, research, I think the North Carolina research park had been successful, but nobody else had really done that much. So um, that. But now yeah. the times are, it, it's really caught on and it's expanded quite oh, a bit. Oh, just, just tremendously, right. yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, Talk a little bit, could you, on that town and gown? Did, did was that going on before or your, during your administration or when Dr. Jeske came? Or yeah. Yeah, the researchers um, might want to know about town and gown. Yeah, well, I would say before 1980, okay. it, we really existed side by side with really not much relationship between the two. It was okay. really interesting there. I mean, Grant Street was just, it was like, like the river. I mean, there was Purdue over there and, and there, there was the city over here. Uh, but then that broke down, as I say, after uh, when the uh, increase in, in uh, population, uh, campus population increased so tremendously and it spilled over into the city. And I think the early conflicts were that Purdue began to think about expanding into the city uh, on the other side of Grant Street. And that really caused some s serious problems because uh, if you f look at a map of West Lafayette, you can see that the, it's sort of a, a narrow spot between Grant Street and the river. And of course, at that time, there was no Wabash Landing. And then it kind of comes down into a cone, and then it goes up around the outside of campus until it gets north of the bypass. Right. But that area right between us and the river uh, was getting squeezed. And uh, our contention was, you've got all this land to the west. Why aren't you expanding to the west? And um, so that, that caused some real friction. Um, I think the last one was when they took university um, the, the uh, bookstore on the corner of Grant and State Street for the Cranard. And it was sort of no more. <laughs> um, and um, yeah, so, so that, that was a very yeah, severe problem. And, and Purdue was, the administration was looking after what they considered sure. the best interests of the university as a world wide university at the same time the city was saying look we're providing wastewater service for you police protection uh, and your faculty lives in West Lafayette so we need to have a world-class city as well as you're looking at a world-class university we've got to be able to have the room and the resources to do, to, to to do what it. we need to do right. and uh, 
I think some of the the conflicts were, well, we know the best way to do it, and if you don't go along, uh, city, you're not cooperating, <laughs> and uh, that 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 got. Uh, Kind of tense from time to time, there. yeah. yeah. <laughs> but we tried to keep it uh, on as as uh, uh, even a plane as possible, and I think in both instances we both knew that the uh, we were totally dependent on the other, and uh, so we were able to work them out. But just things like when the first section of the research park went in, uh, the subdivision control ordinance requires sidewalks. And they did not want to put sidewalks in because it was a big expense. It was a huge expense oh, yeah. because oh, yeah. a lot of land. And we insisted. And that, that was a very tense time. Uh, but uh, but I, you know, I, I've always felt we were correct. Um, and uh, it's proved that that was important now. I mean, people use those sidewalks. And uh, you can't, uh, if they're not there, of course, people don't use them if they're not there. <laughs> was their contention? Right. And now you got the trails. That's, no, that's another that's thing right. that's really changed over the years too, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. Uh, one of the other big uh, issues was the wastewater treatment plant, um, and we had lots of problems with that. Uh, it was the people running the plant were from the old school. You just did the best you could, and uh, if it rained, well, you just had to open the <laughs> gates and let it go. Uh, but with the Clean Water Act, uh, you were under criminal penalties if you'd had that happen. So we had some very tense and very difficult times just internally with our own staff and uh, with some of the, uh, I hate to call them environmentalists because <laughs> they're really more agitators who wanted to uh, say, you know, that you're doing all kinds of terrible things. and. And uh, we were doing the best <laughs> we could. Right. Right. Uh, and then, of course, in order to make these huge changes, in order to meet the requirements of the Clean Water Act, we had to make some very large investments. And the city handles all the wastewater for Purdue. And of course, they, half the flow is from Purdue. And it's, the cost is based on the flow. And uh, so they felt they should get a break and uh, we're saying, you know, well, <laughs> it's by the gallon. <laughs> and if you want to reduce how much inflow you've got from um, rainwater and other things, well, that's that's good. But we we can't have two, <laughs> you know, two uh, schedules: one for Purdue and one for everybody sure. else. So that was kind of a tense time, and the fact that some of the problems at the north end of the city produce at the south end, they didn't think they should have to pay for it. But that was, I said, well, that's the one thing I learned in systems analysis, that everybody in the system is affected. <laughs> Those courses came to root, <laughs> And right? so that course really came through for yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> but I think um, the big difference was when uh, Martin Jeske became president. And it was, it was somewhat of a subtle difference. I mean, I, I, things were not bad, terrible, but they were not as harmonious as one would hope. And, hope we, be, yeah. and the first thing that President Jeske did was he asked me and Mayor uh, Reilly, who was the mayor of Lafayette at the time, and the three legislators to come to breakfast. That was before he was even sworn in. And the first thing he said was, what can Purdue do to help you? And we all went. <laughs> it was really a sea change. And it was, um, it was interesting how everybody down the line <laughs> also <laughs> bought into that idea. And uh, things, I think, really changed tremendously. He appointed that committee. Didn't you have a committee? Yes. Right. And, then, and, yeah. and, he, and that was one of the things we said. If we had a committee so that we can discuss these things publicly, and we've got to include the students, too. I mean, they're sure. part of this. Oh, yeah. And right. they were not used to doing that, having students on these uh, discussion committees, uh, to talk about some of these issues and bring them out in the public and not just have them behind closed doors. And he was very willing to do that, and he put Tom Robinson and his right. highest officers right. uh, on that, and I sat in on it so that we 
you know, show the and emphasis. And it was the publicist that was well publicized too. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And uh, a lot of things came out of that. Yeah. And, and a lot yeah. of people who really were supportive and worked on that. Yeah. Yeah. It it made a big difference sure. in the dean of students office and right. and uh, some of our council members. So is that committee still going? Do you know? I'm not sure whether it still is or not. I know that it was still going when uh, Jan Mills was mayor sure. because I remember she was my appointment to that committee and right. that was one of the ways she got involved. But I don't know. I haven't heard much I about it either. recently. I haven't either. That's why I wondered, but yeah. uh, I'm, not, I'm just not sure. Yeah. We'll have to check I'm, on that. Yeah. They may have broken down into more subcommittees, sure. but uh, uh, it, uh, it it made a, I think make a, yeah. made a big difference because we could bring things out Changing the subject a little bit, uh, that Morton Community Center, Royce, did, were you involved? Was, is it during your time that that came to floor? Oh, floor? yes. Oh, yeah. okay. And that was... Our researchers, I think they'd appreciate that. Yeah. On that. Well, if that was the direct result of this camp, uh, movement of students off campus. Okay. And uh, that, you know, historically, that, that school served everybody south of, well, Meridian, I guess. Uh, and that was the grade school. Sure. Uh, and it also included married student courts. And so all the children from married student courts all uh, were in that there. school. So it was a very unique school with lots of foreign students, which wasn't so prominent then. And we didn't have as many foreign yeah. students in school. So it was really quite a unique school. And it's a, a wonderful building. That's yeah. the one thing I've learned about it. People still say, you know, I just love this building, and there is something about it that just it reminds you. Many yeah. people, the schools that they may have gone to as a grade mm. school, yeah, because you know, it's similar. You know, grade yeah. school, you yeah. kind of sticks in your mind. Yeah, and it had big wide halls and nice rooms with lots of windows, and so it was a wonderful school. And um, so, what was happening then is the population of that school began to drop. Uh, because of the influx of students. And also of, what, moving uh, to the county? And, mm -hmm. and there began to be a movement of the county. The county schools got better, new housing in the county, and the, the development of university farms and uh, uh, Barbary Heights. Right. So all the new young families were moving into those areas and not as many in the older areas. So there came a time when the school corporation said, we've got to decide what to do with this. And one of their choices was to sell it. And we knew what it would be, student apartments. And they would make a million dollars or so on selling it. And the other choice was that the city would buy it. And the third choice was they would give it to the city. So there, there was a real serious conflict between the school Imagine. and the city. And the school felt that they were, again, this kind of idea of being separate, that they had a different mission than the school, uh, city itself. So I said, well, what we need to do is we need to talk to the patrons, the school patrons and the city patrons. So we called a meeting at uh, Morton School, and about three or 400 people showed up. And it was a... I would say contentious, but overwhelmingly, that it should stay with the city. Half of them once thought the school corporation should give it to the city, uh, but uh, I think the uh, the idea of selling it. So then uh, there was an appraisal done, and there was a question, well, is your appraiser better than my appraiser kind of thing? <laughs> And if you appraised it on just the square footage, it came out around six or seven hundred thousand. If you appraised it with the intention of becoming student housing, then it was more like a million. But we were finally able to purchase, the city purchased it for six hundred thousand dollars and absolutely the best thing we ever did. Right. And That's it not is, bad. That's not a bad deal. No. Price, right? And it has been well. And I would say the school corporation did a wonderful job of keeping it up. It was in good shape. And we haven't had to spend. We had to eventually build a new, you know, a new furnace and fix the windows and all that. And but over a period of time, we've probably put a million dollars into it. But it uh, it has served first right. primarily um, the senior citizens 
but now dance, music. Uh, a lot of uh, events are held there, yeah. and of course you've got and, that the playground is good. For, is you got a parking thing oh, right there? It, it's just perfect. Because around yeah. there, the parking is limited. You know. And it's interesting. I said someday this will be the center of a rejuvenation of the village, and now with the new. Uh, apartment complex there and all and those the, new and the shops libraries, and know. the library that has happened. It's centralized a lot. That's so right. it uh, it's kind of come full swoop. You know, one time that was the village; it was a active with with a whole variety of things, and it went downhill. And now it's beginning to come back. Right. And I think we're going to see in the future a uh, renovation of some of the older houses, and people are going to want to be closer. Uh, to the university. Not everybody, but a certain there, number. There would are. be some interest, yeah, that's true. And maintaining that core buildings of the public library and the uh, Morton, I think, is just essential yeah, very to good. that. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's see. Um, executive breakfasts, uh, those were started with during Dr. Jeske? Yes, okay. yes. Yes, those were. And uh, I think she, the new president has continued. She meets with the once a month or something like that, maybe the Chamber of Commerce or something yeah. of that sort. Yeah, uh -huh. I'm, I'm sure sure she's doing sure. that. And and I do give him credit for being very active in the Chamber and all of the uh, United Way, all of those things. Purdue is much more engaged and than they've ever, ever been uh, with the EPICS program and uh, with the uh, engagement Policy. It's really taken for. It's made a huge difference. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And, and it's made a huge difference in how people feel about Purdue, especially people from Lafayette who right. were even more removed from the campus, and right. they appreciate it. Well, that. and I think the Greater Lafayette, the names that you've merged and things of that sort, and the bridge, which brings up the alumni, that yeah. the special award, I think that's very nice about the fountain there. Well, I, I was very pleased. Tell, I, how did they let you know about that? I always well, ask people, like, if you got a Sagamore, you, you have a Sagamore, don't you? Yeah, I have yeah, a couple. Uh, do, yeah. How do you, <laughs> some people say, oh, well, no, they don't want to mention, but I like it because I think it's a surprise. Yeah, it is. The first one that I, that I got, I was when uh, Evan By became governor. Uh, I was on the transition committee. I was I was very active in the uh, uh, Indiana Association of Cities and Towns. And, and you were the president. And I was president right. of the Indiana. So I was on the transition committee, which was a very exciting. And I right. loved it. And he gave me a Sagmore. I said, I don't know, I really deserved that one. But <laughs> For all the work I, was, I enjoyed yeah, doing. Yeah, right? I worked doing it. And then when Governor Kernan was um, uh, governor, and he was a fellow mayor, of course, from South Bend. and. And right. uh, so I was. Uh, Sheila gave me that one, and uh, I was. I was very That's pleased. Very that nice. was a surprise. Yeah. But no, when they told me that they were going to dedicate the fountain, I I really was surprised because I, I had never. Never entered my mind. See, you mind. and Dr. McGinley have got something in common, the fountain out there, and you've got, <laughs> you, you right. have to compare notes. <laughs> that's right. How the water works, yeah. <laughs> the spray and whatever. But that, Joe Payne, who's the parks director and was my parks director, was that was his idea and the idea of it kind of, the spray kind of mimicking the courthouse, I think is just It's really wonderful. Fantastic. It really is. And it's just a great location because yeah. people do the walking over there and in the, in the mm -hmm. skating rink. It's just, it's perfect, you know, it's really yeah. nice. But I think that it also symbolized the, the cooperation between the two right. cities. Right. And as you know, Jim Reilly and I were, Jim I was, was gonna the- I was going to yeah, worked very yeah. closely together. We worked very closely together. We, and uh, we, um, I think we both had the attitude, and Dave Heath also reflected the same attitude that what's good for Lafayette's good for West yeah. Lafayette and vice versa, and Purdue. And, um, Sometimes the city of Lafayette hasn't always been as active on this side of the river, but Jim really uh, cared about what happened over here. He was always, he always showed up for everything that we asked him to come over here. And um, I think railroad relocation kind of brought the community right. together. I think that's, when I think of yeah. him and I think of many people, and, and there are new people that have come since, since that's been finished, they can't believe the tracks actually existed. Yeah, you know, they I just, know. It. Unless they see a picture, it just blows their mind. Yeah. <laughs> well, and of course, the fascinating thing about the tracks, and I'm sure you probably know this story, but it's worth repeating that uh, 
Uh, John Myers was the Republican congressman for many, many years here, and he became good friends of Jim and mine and a lot of other people. And uh, he had been hearing about railroad relocation, but his daughter went to school at Purdue. So one time he came to visit her and they were driving down Fifth Street and all of a sudden he looked in his rear view mirror and here comes the Amtrak train right behind him <laughs> on the tracks and he about fainted and he pulled, he pulled off the tracks and just barely you know, missed being hit by the Amtrak train and he said, now what's the stuff about railroad relocation? <laughs> and he Tell me a little bit about it, right? And he became a super advocate for railroad relocation and was personally responsible for getting a major share of the federal funding, which would never have happened without that. And, you, and it was continually, they yeah. saw it even in the days when it was really weak, you may not get it. You yeah, know. that's so right. Able, and you were able to get it finished. And it was, uh, and it was truly a community project. Yeah. And um, then using the old bridge, um, and converting it into this pedestrian bridge. And then West Lafayette helped with money that we had for transportation and helped finance that bridge. And I think it was symbolic of the bridge between us. Uh, and between the two cities. The, and, and then the idea of the linear downtown came out of our our, our um, strategic plan, but it was also part of the kind of the chamber's involvement so that from hilltop to hilltop, from the top of the Purdue Hill all the way up to Ninth Street Hill. Uh, and, and it's proved to be a, a, a legitimate and real Very bridge well and between the two cities. And uh, you know, if you're familiar with any other cities, uh, we just came back from Eugene, Eugene Springfield. I mean, they've got a highway between them. It, it was as if the other doesn't exist. Uh, and I know that Bloomington, Normal, uh, again, they're, they're two separate cities, although Lafayette and West Lafayette are two, but I think we've you been able to bridge it. You feel more these days, yeah. which, is which has taken time, but it, it exists. Yeah. And it's, it's working out very well, yeah. I think. One other word I was going to, you were the, um, you also, also got the Distinguished Alumni Award from the College of Liberal Arts. That's yes. very nice. Yes, I was very pleased That's very about nice. that. Yes, I, I was. What uh, post-mayoral activities? What do you um, tell researchers yeah. what you're involved yeah. in now? Yeah. Well, b before we, we oh. leave this, I okay. did want to mention the one thing that I would say I'm most proud of is Good. being uh, during my, my mayoral, mayoral term it was in 1987. We decided that I, I, one of my professors at Purdue was a fellow named Graham Toft. And uh, he went on to work in Indianapolis and be head of the Economic Development Commission. And uh, he did a lot of assisting cities with strategic planning. So I had talked to him about this. And so we said, well, how would you like to do that with, for West Lafayette? Could we hire you to do that? So he did. And he also brought a couple of people with him, Tim Munger, who a lot of people know here, who started the Crisis Center and a number of other things, was working in Indianapolis on Center City, Indianapolis. And so they came and we did a lot of um, talking to the population about what, how, what role should the city play? Should we just fix streets and hire police and you know just kind of take care of things? Or should we be aggressive and try to make some big differences? And at that time, Sears had closed and gone, and it was had been there abandoned for five years. And and there was a junk car lot, mm -hmm. if you remember. The the levee was really very ugly. And uh, I almost remind you of what people said years ago when the river did overflow down in that area. You know, yeah. years before your time, people yeah. used to talk about it. They were it flooding down. Yeah, there. and it the was older people that were here in the 40s and whatever. Yeah, no, it was it was in very bad shape and, and ugly. <laughs> and to people um, coming into the city. Yeah, right. It was a very you know, unpleasant view. So we then put together a large steering committee and we tried to make it representative of the city, parts of the city, uh, both political parties and the, the whole variety of people uh, to do a strategic plan. Well, we spent a couple of years at it, did a lot of talking, and, and people hadn't done strategic planning for cities. I mean, that, would, that had been kind of the popular thing, you know, that came out of the um, Army and the Defense Department, but nobody had done much of it for cities. 
So kind of the theme that came out of it was West Lafayette was a knowledge-centered community with Purdue, with our strong school system, and with the research park. Mm -hmm. And that what we needed to do was to put our efforts and our resources into those things that made a difference and, uh, and, and uh, be strategic <laughs> in how we <laughs> conducted ourselves. Uh, and going along with Purdue's standard of excellence of uh, that, that that was something we needed to strive for. So we developed the plan of redevelopment of the levee, uh, the trails, and uh, that was certainly the thing that came out of all the discussion was people wanted a beautiful city, one with green and, and one that, they, that was attractive that they would enjoy and then the development of the research park. And about that time, there was a big push to get uh, chip plants uh, for computers. And uh, uh, West Lafayette was a place they were looking at. And I did not think that fit in with our plan at all. And that was kind of a bone of contention. I really drug my feet and I was concerned about the safety because I know what's happened in other chip plants. There's a lot of leakage into the groundwater and that's where our wells are. And uh, I did talk to some of the people on campus and they agreed that there were some safety issues. Well, luckily, the chip company went to Idaho when the ice noticed they just closed down the other day. So, <laughs> so I'm glad we didn't. <laughs> but there was a tremendous push to do that. And uh, so that was the time that we decided that the research park, we were gonna put our money and our efforts into that. And of course that's Purdue's baby, I really are. Um, although we did do all the sewer work and the um, infrastructure and the, the sidewalks and the curbs and streets. So that was this three-pronged attack. And um, the levee where the Wabash Landing was the centerpiece because that was what we were trying to do. And so we found a developer who was willing to work uh, to develop that land. And, and he had a, a person who, actually I just saw him yesterday at the Purdue game, or Saturday at the Purdue game, and he was saying, oh, that was the best thing we ever did. And he built the apartments down, oh, down there. And uh, that we had to redo all the sewers down on the levee. The state put in brand new roads there. We had to put in a whole bunch of new roads and then they developed the land. Uh, and um, before we started it, we did something that I was a little worried about. Um, the consultant said, well, let's ask people how much public money you wanna spend on this. And I said, well, how can people know that? And they said, well, they'll get an idea. You know, is it 5%, 15, 20, 50%? And they came up with kind of a 15% of the cost should be no more than 15% for public money. And so this took place over about a four year period, which is pretty fast sure. because we had to take down power lines, remove yeah. power lines, a big bill. And uh, it was an interesting coalition because it was the developer, it was the city, the state uh, at that time put in quite a bit of transportation money we got federal money, and uh, the unions, the International Carpenters Union, was one of the investors. And they said, well, this is a good place for our pension money. This provides jobs for our members, and I can tell you we had no, no labor problems on that job at all. <laughs> and when, we, when they needed more bricklayers, no problem. We got the bricklayers <laughs> right away. <laughs> and, we can uh, work with you. And, and some of the developers said, gosh, we've never worked with unions before. And they had a wonderful relationship and just shows that if you have a common goal and, and everybody has a benefit out of and it. And they all buy in on they it. They sure did. And so it ended up then, the, all the apartments came in about that time and um, it ended up being a hundred, hundred and fifty million dollar development. And if, Anybody had ever told you, told me that I would have anything to do with $150 million in development, I would have said, no way, I don't even know what I would. <laughs> but it was, again, a, a team effort. 
and uh, we had a really good city team that did all the background infrastructure work and then this group from Indianapolis and uh, and it, it and That's then right. the banks we had to build the parking garage the city right. did and the local banks bought our bonds uh, without any property tax backup because we couldn't do it sure. with property tax backup and uh, so they and they they have been paid so I mean it's the parking garage was essential to making the the thing work and then of course the hotel came in and that and then um, a local family the McDonald's uh, uh, gave us $150,000 to start the ice skating rink, which right. was a, yeah. a nice touch, which we'd yeah. never counted on. Yeah. But it was a big project because you had to fill all that whole area. It isn't the newest addition, of course, Sonia, will be the rowers. Yes, the, yes. yes, right. What and, a great enhancement that and is. And that be. was started about that time, too, and I'm so thrilled that I th we just had the groundbreaking. Yes, yeah, that's right. And uh, so that 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 whole idea of protecting the waterfront, utilizing the waterfront, and uh, with the bridge uh, and and the uh, apartments, and it's being used all the time. And, right. and the other thing that when we did the the uh, planning was everybody said it's got to serve everybody. It can't just serve. West Lafayette people or students or it, it's got to serve everybody and that's what it has it done. Is, that's and, right. And it, you know it's not perfect there's still area that hasn't been developed yet but but overall I, it's but overall it's, and all the big yeah. events are now you know, that bridge just brings people yeah. together and it's just yeah. perfect. Yeah, yeah. so and that's really plaza it's nice yeah. So that it came out of that and then the the, the trails which right. Haven't didn't get a lot of publicity as they were being done, but there were lots of pieces that had to be done. It took a lot of time to get those little pieces all put together. But again, I've had more people say that's the best thing you ever did were those those trails that everybody <laughs> along uses with everything them. else. Everybody yeah. uses them. Older people, people in strollers, and it's just been great. And it just course, adds a nice quality. It enhances the quality yeah. of the city. And then the research park is the jewel. Right. I mean, it has then, because before that, West Lafayette was almost entirely dependent on residential housing to finance their um, city. And so right. with the research park, and then and there's like two or 3,000 employees up there now. That's right. Uh, right. Which is as big as Subaru. That's right, exactly. So they, the strategic plan really was uh, if there was anything that I would say I'm most proud of that by I far so. was was the uh, was the jewel because right. it, and it because it's it's go, it's an ongoing project it's going to I mean I think 20 years from now there's still going to be things They'll happening there. They'll have to send there. us a card you and I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. bring us up to date right. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, in closing, um, I was going to ask you if your post activities and then how about a favorite Purdue tradition? Oh, okay. Well, I, I guess right now I'm, uh, I'm, I've am i been working in the uh, arts. I helped uh, put together a strategic plan for the arts, which I, I enjoyed. I uh, it was entirely something entirely different and yet it did draw on some of my experience with strategic planning. Again, citizen participation, gra grassroots, and then take action. Um, I was president of the Art Museum and I'm on the the school foundation, parks foundation, and the library foundation. So I've stayed in a sort of not as active a role, but I've still stayed busy. Kept and in. I'm very I have very active in my at church. Uh, we're doing a family promise for homeless families, and I've been active in that. So I uh, so I have not Which wanted is, for anything to do. That's fine. Yeah. And you're doing the things that you enjoy doing yeah. and you're not overdoing it. Well, I probably am. <laughs> but that's the way you're I not, prefer. You're busy but enjoying yeah. it. And a favorite Purdue tradition? Gosh, that's hard to say. There's so many things. But oh. I don't suppose there's anything more exciting than a fall football weekend. I mean, it seems to bring uh, everybody together to campus to celebrate their days on campus, uh, always to honor somebody that's uh, prominent now, 
and uh, the excitement of the students and uh, their future. So I guess a fall football weekend and, uh, and Purdue just gets more on the winning side instead of It'll two be points better. behind. Right. It'll be yeah. even better. <laughs> but I think the, the leadership of Purdue has been uh, has been good, and uh, I, I certainly think that's got to continue, is that partnership and collaboration. That's, that's what made Lafayette and West Lafayette strong, is that collaboration with, uh, with the business community. Our business community is quite active and very uh, far-thinking and progressive. Uh, everybody that's worked with the business community said, this is a different place than I, I won't mention any other towns, but other towns in the Midwest. Right. And yeah. uh, so I think we've been very fortunate with I'll that. I'll leave it up to you. Any closing, as you look, I'll leave it. Any closing comments, anything you'd like to share with us? Yeah. Well, it's or been... Or something with, <laughs> I forgot to ask. Yeah. Well, it's been exciting and challenging to be, to be the mayor for 24 years of... Uh, a college town. I didn't think you'd be in there that long, did you? Never, never thought I would ever do that or be there that long or do the things it's, we did. It's rough, you know, yeah. running. <laughs> it was, and there are times when I laid awake at night thinking, how will I ever <laughs> solve this problem? <laughs> but I think, you know, the, the real key is involving other people and um, being able to uh, uh, use the the resources that you have, and, uh, and then and that you can draw upon. Yes, and that and and people really want to work together, and they just need to have a common vision. And I think that uh, we've pretty well been able to uh, have a common vision for this area and from Purdue, which is excellence and and moving ahead. So. Good. That's very good. It's been, I want a, it's to thank been you. a great journey. Great. Thank you, Sonia. Yeah. I really, this concludes it. I thank you very yeah. much. Okay. My pleasure. Well.